Let's do a little, uh, a little game here this Easter Sunday morning. Uh, logo recognition quiz. Let's see how good you are. Your life is surrounded by symbols, by images. And most of the time you see them, you don't even think, but unconsciously, you, you, uh, subconsciously, you know what they mean and you make associations. So let's look at the first one here. What's this? I know some of you have accepted Steve Jobs into your heart. Others of you, maybe not so much. We, whatever your opinion of Apple, you instantly know what that is. And you make associations. So how about the next one? This is not hard game. I know. Yes, Nike. Some of you are like, yes, Nike. Others of you are like, I don't know about that. Tiger Woods, maybe he's back in Nike's good graces. Who knows? But the point is, you know automatically, worldwide, what that symbol means. Now with the next one. Ah, uh, yes. I don't know why a coffee company would choose a woman with crab pinchers for hands to be their symbol, but they did. And I know what it means. It means good coffee, and I go there often. Maybe you do as well. And the last one, we all know this one. Right, right. You look for this wherever you go. LTE, boo. Wi-Fi, Yay. Like my wife, who's, who's using all our data? Texting the kids. You are right now texting them using our data, right? <laughs> okay, one more, one more. Are you ready? How about this one? What? Exactly. That's what I thought. Every hour, everybody's like, hey, Wi-Fi, Starbucks, Nike. Huh? This is the ancient Christian symbol for the Lamb of God. People living in the first, second, third, fourth, fifth centuries would have seen this and instantly known what it meant the way you know about Nike, Apple, Starbucks, Wi-Fi. And we're going to talk about what this symbol means, what it has to do with Easter, and what it has to do with us, the Lamb of God. And then we're going to look at John chapter 1. I'm going to read verses 29 to 37. If you have your Bible, that's great. If not, it'll be on the screen. You can follow with me. This is John. If you're new to the Bible, that's totally fine. John, who wrote the Gospels, one of, is a Gospel writer, but he's talking about another John, John the Baptist. They're not the same dude, in case you're confused. John, the gospel writer, is recording what John the Baptist said about Jesus when Jesus came to the Jordan River. Verse 29. The next day he, John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came, baptizing with water, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit, the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I've seen, and I've borne witness, that this is the Son of God. The next day John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by, and he said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Now, John the Baptist, not the author again, is, you could sum up his whole life purpose in that passage we just read. In fact, you could make the strong case that his whole life, the purpose of his life is summed up in one sentence, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's it. That's the reason he came. That's the mission of his life. Could you sum up the purpose of your life in one sentence? Because you get it down to a sentence. Why are you here? What, are you, what do you exist for? What's the mission of your life? Some of you are like, no chance. <laughs> Some of you maybe like, like me, you're like, well, I want to be a good father. I want to be a good husband. I want to be a good pastor. I want to I wanna do well in these areas. But you're, could you get it to a sentence? John the Baptist, his whole life was to point to someone else, the Lamb of God. That's what he's here for. And you could do worse than having a mission statement like that for your life. And this word behold is a very interesting word in Greek. I'm guessing you don't use this word in regular conversation very often. How many of you this week were like, behold, it is 12 o'clock. Let us go now to lunch and feast, right? You probably didn't talk that way. <laughs> behold, we think, when you hear that word and you think it means, hey, look. Like, hey, look, there he is. It means more than that. It's a single Greek word that means to, to look carefully, to stare intently. Behold means this. It means to pay attention, to look carefully at something to behold, to consider deeply. It means to focus, not just your eyes, but your mind, your heart, your life on something. So John is not just declaring, hey, look, there he is. He's also saying, behold him, consider him, who he is and what he's done. And that's what I wanna do. I wanna invite you with me to behold the Lamb of God this Easter morning. But it's hard for us. Because for one thing, he's not walking around the earth anymore, so how do you behold someone who's not physically here? Second, Easter is full of weird traditions that get kind of in the way of our beholding Jesus. Eggs, bunnies, candy, ham. It's nice, but it's not really the point. How many of you have Easter traditions? 
You going to eat ham later? Do you ever eat ham any other time than Easter? <laughs> Candy eggs, the whole thing. Cheesy potatoes, I heard somebody say it. Yes. <laughs> you got your traditions. How about you do the Easter basket hiding thing or egg hunts? When I was a kid, for many years, we had Easter at my Uncle Bill's house, and he was a minister, and we would have an egg hunt on the lawn of the church that he pastored. And they, would, they hid the eggs by basically throwing them on the grass. And then they lined all the kids up on the driveway, gave us all baskets, and said, ready, go. Brilliant idea, parents. I have all girl cousins on both sides and two sisters. And so I was like at the starting line like I was at the Olympics, right? Go. And when they said go, I got all the eggs. I mean, I got all of the eggs. <laughs> my basket, my pants pockets, my jacket, I, I had all the eggs. My sisters and my cousins were crying, but I was feeling good. So they came back and my aunt Nancy and my mom sat us all down, took away all my eggs and distributed them evenly among my cousins and sisters. Now I was crying and they were happy. And that's when I realized, I think I'm not a socialist. No, I didn't think that. <laughs> not in my, that's, that's a bad joke. The point is, what is the point? The point is, these, these, these don't, don't, some of you are like, boo, yay, whatever. You're getting distracted. This is, you're, you're illustrating my point. We get distracted from the, what matters. Stuff gets in our way. John Baptist came and said, behold, the Lamb of God. Behold him. Get past the cultural noise, the postmodern skepticism, the family traditions, and consider who he is and what he's done and what that means for your life. And I want to do this by walking you very briefly through the story of the Lamb. The story of the Lamb. You really can't know Jesus unless you know him in this context in the story. Because John the Baptist did not say, Behold the great moral teacher who shows us how to behave. Behold the, the human guru. Behold the leader of men. Jesus was all those things, but he said, behold the lamb. Now, I don't know what comes into your mind when you hear the word lamb, but maybe it's something like this. Maybe, oh, lammies. I actually wanted to have a lamb on stage for Easter. I called petting zoos. I was all excited about it. My staff was like, that's a terrible idea. What if it poops? What if it jumps out? What if it runs away? And, and then I saw a video that made fun of pastors who use animals as gimmicks. I thought, okay, fine. So I, you have a picture instead. No, Behold the lamb. This is not what would have been in the minds of the first century people listening to John the Baptist. It would look more like this. It's a picture when we were in Israel of real sheep. They're not all fluffy and white in green fields. Green pastures are hard to come by. So in Psalm 23, he leads me in green pastures. Those are hard to find. You need a shepherd to guide you there. Water is scarce. They're not, they look kind of smelly and dirty. And in the mind of the average person listening to John the Baptist in that time, when they heard, behold, the lamb, they think about sacrificial lamb. They would have thought of temple sacrifice, lamb slain for sin. That's foreign to us, but that's what they would have instantly thought of. And they knew all about that, but they'd never heard someone call a human being, a man, the lamb. That made no sense. What did John mean? You cannot understand Jesus unless you know him as the lamb. This is, from Genesis to Revelation, this is a theme that runs through the whole Bible, the story of the Lamb. Genesis 22, this is the story of Abraham and his son Isaac. Abraham and Sarah were 95 and 90 years old, and God said, I'm going to give you a son, and they laughed. And they named their son when he was born, because the joke was on them, laughter. Isaac means laughter. God's beautiful Heavenly joke that they were given a son in their old age. And that boy, Isaac, becomes the apple of their eye, the hope of their nation, God's blessing to the world. Everything was bound up in the promise of a son, and here he was. And then God does something unthinkable to Abraham. He asks him to lay down his son, sacrifice him, which to us sounds barbaric and crazy. Would you lay down your greatest dreams, your greatest hopes before the throne of God? And on the way for the sacrifice, Isaac says to his father Abraham in Genesis 22, verse 7, My father, he said, here I am, my son. He said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them together. Those two sentences, the question by Isaac and the answer by Abraham, give you the foundation for the story of the lamb for the whole Bible. Where is the lamb? and God will provide. Where's the lamb? There has to be a lamb, and God himself will provide it. That's the, sort of the, that's the beginning, the prologue to the story of the lamb. There needs to be a sacrifice, but who will it be? We trust God to provide it. The place where this story is most poignant for Israel, God's people in the Old Testament, is in the story of the Exodus. How many of you have seen the cartoon animated feature the Prince of Egypt. Yeah, a few of you. 
Old Testament movie, Ten Commandments, was on last night. Anybody watch that? Anybody actually read the Bible, the story? <laughs> Exodus 12 tells the story. It's a long chapter. It tells the story of the Exodus. And I'm going to read to you a couple of sections from Exodus 12, verses 3, 5, 7, and 13, just to give us as cliff notes here. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, that's the month of Nisan, late March, early April. So we're right in the middle of that. Every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. Our lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and they shall take some of the food, the blood, and put it on two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This is the central story of Israel, God delivering them out of slavery in Egypt. And he says to them, you need, there needs to be a sacrifice. And those who are under the blood of the lamb will be spared. Are you seeing the theme of the story of the lamb? There's a sacrifice needed. Only God can provide it. And he's given this symbol of the coming sacrifice that those who are under its blood will be spared. But these go on over and over and over again throughout the Old Testament. Now, some of you, maybe you're new to this or you're a bit of a skeptic or you're thinking this whole Easter thing is just a prelude to brunch because my grandma said get dressed up and made us do this, whatever the case. The, I know that to our modern ears, the idea of sin and sacrifice sounds crazy. But if there's a God who made all that exists and made you in his image, then by definition, he would have claim over your life even if you, would, even if you would deny his existence. I once talked to a man who said to me, listen, God cannot possibly hold me accountable to his standard because I have not accepted that as my standard for life. Okay, there's a lot of issues with that, but we'll just set it aside for a minute. Let's pretend that's true. It's not true, by the way. God doesn't need you to agree to the terms of the deal to be God. But let's pretend that's true. And we don't use God's standard. We only use your standard for goodness. Let's say we only measure you on your own idea. If we could put a little digital recorder in your brain and extract from you your ideas of what is a good person and flash it up on the screen, your code for how a good and righteous person should live in the world. Don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal, don't murder, be generous, whatever, you're, whatever it is. We list it all out there. And we put a little GoPro in your brain and your mouth and with your body and it followed you around, not for your whole life, that would be unfair, but just for like a decade. Say from age 20 to age 30, that's it. <laughs> And, and we just followed you around and recorded everything you thought, said, and did. Which of you could measure up to your own standard of goodness? I couldn't. And that's your goofy ideas of what's good and bad. If there's a God in heaven, and if he made all that exists, I'm, I'm, you may not believe it, but if it's true, then we're held accountable to his standard whether we want to admit that or not. And the Bible says we all fall short. This brings us to the promise of the lamb. The promise of the lamb. Because all these Old Testament sacrifices offered over and over again every year are pointing us to something that will be once for all time. Remember Abraham's statement, God himself will provide the lamb. Of course, he meant that in the moment with his son, but God is also speaking about something ultimate through that statement. The prophet Isaiah, writing 700 years before Christ, wrote this great prophecy about what Jesus would endure for us. Listen to what he says in verses five through seven of Isaiah 53. But he was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. That's temple sacrifice language right there. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Isaiah is saying, there is coming a perfect substitute, sacrifice once for all, to take care of it, to pay the debt you owe. The Lamb of God came to pay a debt he did not owe, because you and I owe a debt we could not pay. The story of the Lamb is a story of what God is going to do about people who aren't in relationship with him because of their sin and need to be brought home, brought back. You know what? You don't need another life coach or guru or teacher. You don't need more good advice. The world is full of good advice and bad advice, quite frankly. 
You don't need another therapist or, or personal trainer or someone or, or, or bestseller to read to get figure out your life. I'm not saying those things are bad. I'm saying people are pursuing something that, that they cannot get from inside this life. What do you need? You need the lamb. You need someone to do for you what you cannot do for yourself, to set you free from bondage, to pay a debt you cannot pay. So many people think Christianity works like this. I try hard, I go to church, I give a little, I serve a little, I do, I, 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 and I present to God my good record. Not perfect, but hopefully good enough. And then God looks and goes, well, you could have done better here, but that guy's a wreck, and on the compar- by comparison, I guess you're in. God isn't great on the curve. He's God. You don't present him a good record and hope it's good enough. He gives you his perfect record in the lamb who died for you and invites you into his family. And then he begins to work on your life. I remember talking to a guy who said, you know, I'll go to church once I get some things cleaned up in my life. (laughs) That's like saying, I'll go to the gym once I get in shape. (laughs) Doesn't work like that. Listen to what Peter writes, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 through 21. He's, this is Peter, who denied he even knew Jesus, writes this after his resurrection. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from your empty way of life, but with the precious blood of Christ, the lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in him. Jesus is the lamb without blemish who was slain for you. Do you know what, what Peter says? He goes, you know that what, what changed you was not silver or gold. He means you can't buy this. You can't earn it. You can't achieve it. You can't accomplish it. You can only humbly fall down and receive it. And he tells us the lamb is without blemish. That's Jesus' perfect life. And that he was slain for you and that God raised him from the dead. This is the resurrection of the lamb. The last little point here, the resurrection of the lamb. The story of the lamb doesn't stop at the cross. If it did, it'd just be one more innocent man who died in the place of others, and there's a lot of those examples. That's not the story of Jesus, the lamb of God. It doesn't end at the cross. It does not even end at the empty tomb. Well, what's left? It goes through the cross, through the empty tomb, where? to the throne, to the throne. Let me read to you from the book of Revelation, chapter five. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain. When Jesus rose from the dead and he appeared to Thomas the doubter, what did he say? Touch me, put your hand here. He in his resurrected body still bore the marks of his sacrificial death. I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. Then I looked and I heard a voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they were saying, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea, and all that is in them, saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. That's where the story of the Lamb ends. That can be your story. That's the message of Christianity. We're lost like wandering sheep. We don't even know it. We've broken God's law. We need a sacrifice in our place. It would crush us to do it ourselves. God provides a way through a Lamb. And do you know what happens right before this in Revelation 5? There's this whole part in the first few verses where John, who wrote Revelation, uh, sees some, a scroll that nobody can open. And I don't want to get too into the details. Some of you love Revelation, but leave that aside for another day. And he, he says, only the Lion of Judah can open the scroll. The Lion of Judah is Jesus. Lion of the tribe of Judah. And then he says, the Lamb will open the scroll. But the Lion will open the scroll. The Lamb and the Lion are the same person, Jesus Christ. And you should be glad that Jesus is both your Lion and your Lamb. Because you want a God who's strong and bold and fights for you. And you want a God who's humble and meek and dies for you. And Jesus is both in combination. Reflecting the heart of God. How many of you have read the Chronicles of Narnia? Every hand should be going up. No? I'm going to preach on that next time. 
In, 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 the, in the Voyage of the Dawn Treader, Lucy, the youngest of the Pevensey children, is talking to a little lamb in a, in a, in a field of green. Remember the story? And the lamb is explaining to her how to get into Aslan's country. Aslan is the Christ figure, the lion. And the lamb is saying, you, here's how you get into Aslan's world from your world. They have this conversation. And the lamb says, there is a way into my country from all the worlds, dear one, said the little lamb. But as the lamb spoke, his snowy white flushed into a tawny gold, and his size changed as he was transformed into the great lion Aslan himself, towering above them and scattering gold and light from his mane as it shook. Oh, Aslan, said Lucy. Will you tell me how to get into your country from my world? Child, I shall be telling you your whole life long. I love that. He says, I'm going to tell you how you get into my world through the lamb. The lamb, the story of the lamb is how you get into it. What, is Aslan's, what does it mean, get into his world? It means how do you know that God loves you and forgives you and is with you and won't leave you? How do you live a life despite all of your brokenness and screw-ups? How do you live a life where God is with you and you're confident in his love? That's life in Aslan's country. That's the life God calls you to, through the lamb. Remember what John the Baptist said. Behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the really good people of the world. God's love is as wide as the world. No one is excluded. No one. But it's as narrow as the lamb. I want to finish with that last statement. Behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. How many of you this week saw the uh, tragic fire of the great cathedral of Notre Dame burning? Saw an image like this probably. Horrific. That great spire, that iconic spire fell. I was standing at the Persinger Center, supposed to be working out, but I was actually just watching the TV because that thing was burning. And I could see through the window, the fitness center, our own steeple tower, which is nothing compared to that. And I, and I read in the newspaper the next day that over a billion dollars in less than a week had been pledged to the reconstruction of, of the great cathedral. One man who pledged $100 million said, I pledge this to the resurrection of our great lady. Notre Dame means our lady. Resurrection of our great lady. And don't get me wrong, I hope it is restored because it's a tragedy and it's a beautiful building. But what is it they're rebuilding, really? What is they're hoping to, to resurrect? A monument to medieval architecture? It certainly is that. A symbol of national French pride? It's absolutely that, too. There is no Notre Dame if the Lamb is not on the throne. It doesn't get built. And, and despite that it may be rebuilt someday, it eventually is going to crumble. So will this building and that tower and all things made by human hands. It doesn't last. It doesn't mean it's not good and glorious. It just does not last. Now look at this image from inside. Pile of ash and rubble. It's not a coincidence in my mind that the great golden cross of the altar is untouched amidst all the devastation. What lasts? What endures? You do, I do, and he does. C.S. Lewis says, you've never met a mere mortal. Nations, civilizations, empires, these are mortal. And their life is to ours as that of a gnat, he says. But we interact with people who are immortal, far more valuable than the hundred billion, million, trillion dollars it takes to rebuild Notre Dame. You are more valuable in God's sight than that great cathedral. That's why the story of the lamb matters. And God, because of the resurrection, is engaging in a great restoration project in the world. And it isn't bricks and mortar and steel and gold. It's individual hearts, one life at a time, redeeming them, reclaiming them, remaking them in his image. That's what he's up to. That's why the story of the lamb matters. Let's go back one last time to that statement that John the Baptist said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I want you to think about this. What does behold mean, remember? It means to look at, to consider, to pay careful attention to. It means to fix the gaze of your face and your heart, your mind, your whole life in a particular direction. You're all beholding something. You are. Behold my 401k, which takes away my fear of financial insecurity. Right? <laughs> Behold my children's GPA, which makes me feel better than I deserve, right? We're all, we're all fixing our mind and heart and life on something. Will it last or will it burn? Will it crumble under the weight of your expectations? 
John the Baptist is not just saying, hey, look over there. He's saying, turn the gaze of your life to him and keep it there. Fix your eyes and your heart on him. Behold him, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Let's pray. Father God, it's, these things are sometimes beyond my ability to communicate and ours to understand. But this great story of our desperate need to be set free and your great love in giving your son, the story of the lamb. And we're so grateful that the lamb is also on the throne. He, he died for us, he rose for us, and you are reigning for us, Lord Jesus. And you invite us into that life, resurrection life, a life we don't deserve, a life we cannot earn, but that you freely give by your sacrificial death and resurrection. As we go from this place, remind us, there's only one worth beholding, and it's you, Jesus, the Lamb of God. Amen.